I'm Ginny Kim Watson. I teach in the English department at NYU and I'm also associated faculty with the comparative literature department. Uh, my primary field is post-colonial studies, post-colonial literature and theory, and within that I emphasize um, the Asia Pacific. So I'm interested in um, questions of decolonization and development uh, in the post-colonial Pacific. And I'm Magali Hermias Tiseira, and I am an assistant professor in the English department at the University of Mississippi. I also graduated from NYU in May 2012 from the Comparative Literature Department, and Ginny was actually a member of my committee. Uh, I work on Latin America and Africa. My dissertation was on novels about dictators specifically, but my work more generally is about our concept of world literature and how we think comparatively across continents. We are very excited to, be, to have received the Humanities Initiative Grant. Um, so we're putting on a one-day symposium. Um, it's on the 1st of November and its title is Reading Dictatorship, Looking Back at the Post-Colony. Um, and so it's, we've invited six different speakers um, and they'll be giving presentations that deal in various ways on the phenomenon of dictators and dictatorships. And it's a, obviously this is a topic that is, has very sort of mainstream um, currency, especially given the, the war on terror, or the wars on terror, um, the Arab Spring, um, and, and these sort of ongoing questions. So it has a very mainstream uh, currency, but we want to look a little more deeply at the question of dictatorships, um, more historically, and also using the lens of literature and aesthetic production more generally to sort of access these questions. Um, so that's sort of in a nutshell what what we hope that the symposium will uh, will achieve. Um, I think the question of literature, obviously we are both um, literary s scholars and so this is uh, the, the field that we work in, uh, but to us this, this can bring I think a lot of different questions to the sort of usually political science uh, approach to to dictatorship. So, so one of the main questions would be, you know, what's the relationship between an authoritarian political regime and its literary representation? So what can reading literature on and of dictatorships tell us about those experiences? Um, and I think the other question is also the timeliness. You know, now post-Arab Spring, all these, a lot of these dictators were set up during the sort of decolonizing and Cold War years. Um, and a lot of the novels, there's a substantial body of literature uh, from all of these regions um, that deal with that. Uh, so one of the questions will be, you know, what, is, what does that look like now from this moment in time? Um, and then I think the other framing question is really the comparative question. We're bringing together Latin Americanists, Africanists, uh, and people working on South Asia. I work on East and Southeast Asia. So we really want to think comparatively what, what, what can happen when we talk across, across our different regions. In planning the symposium, one of the big shifts, certainly for me, was having spent several years very obsessed with the figure of the dictator as I was writing the dissertation. Thinking dictatorship a little bit more broadly is very productive. You realize that um, while the dictator is a very iconic figure that we recognize, even even from film, even from popular culture, I think the week I defended my dissertation, Sasha Baron Cohen's The Dictator came out. It's something that keeps coming back in popular culture. That's just one tiny corner of this very broad, field of representations, um, literary and cinema and visual arts, of ways of grappling with what we could broadly call dictatorship or authoritarian government. And, you know, dictator, dictatorship, authoritarian government are different things. And what we're interested in is finding a way to talk about all of these. There's people with tools working in these particular corners, and we wanted to bring them together and see what happens. And this means that we're also bringing regions together because there are different political forms in different regions and in different historical moments. It'll be interesting to see how familiar and unfamiliar the conversation can feel. We're both working on monographs um, around this question, but in different regions and sort of through different questions. So I should also say what's nice about the symposium is that it allows us to do collaborative work, which in the humanities uh, is not very common, actually. It's unlike the sciences, you know, we don't, we don't really write books together very mm -hmm. often. Pretty much everybody's off in their own little research world. Um, so I should say that's another really nice thing about this. Mm -hmm. um, but my own um, uh, uh, interest in dictatorship and dictatorship literature came out from my, my first book, which was actually on um, the Asian tigers. It was a book called The New Asian City, and it was dealing with um, 
the sort of post-war miracle economies of South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, um, which are very often viewed as kind of the models of third world development. Um, so I was really interested in, in really, especially the post-war period of rapid industrialization and urbanization, and how that was narrated through literature, and so sort of a different, a different side of that story than you know the kind of amazing um, you know Asian tiger miracle rise. Um, and so while dealing with that, of course, I, I had to encounter uh, the question of authoritarianism because all of those, all of those cases had, uh, you know, that, that industrialization happened under the direction of uh, authoritarian or dictatorship in, you know, government. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, it, it, it sort of confounds the common liberal logic of uh, and um, that the embrace of a capital system brings democracy. So in fact, it didn't, or it didn't for quite a long time. I mean, you have, you know, Taiwan. I think has the record for almost four decades under martial law. Singapore kind of ongoing uh, authoritarian state, and um, South Korea, which are not a, a lot. A lot of people recognize, I think, because North Korea has overshadowed it, but did have military dictators for um, uh, most of their independence post-colonial post history until 93 was the first um, uh, non-military, the first civilian leader. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in the 60s and 70s in South Korea, Park Chung-hee was a sort of archetypal um, dictator. Um, so, so I've become more interested in those questions um, uh, and found that there, there are uh, quite a lot of uh, works that, that deal in in different ways with that experience, um, allegorical novels because of censorship that write, um, you know, about these these dictatorships and rulers. But of course, you know, it's set somewhere else um, or in a fictional country. And I know that's something um, Magali also has encountered. Mm -hmm. um, so those sorts of questions, you know, um, were, were were very appealing to me. And and I think also looking at the ways. Um, I think a lot of people now, both in literary studies but also in political theory, are really looking at this question of um, sovereignty, post-colonial nations, and what has happened to sovereignty, especially in the age of globalization. Uh, you know, do multinational companies and the World Bank and the UN, you know, is this the end of the nation state? What kind of sovereignty did they did they have anyway? I mean, so mm -hmm. I think. You know, the question of um, dictatorships and sovereignty is a very, um, very fruitful one for me. This has been a very pleasant surprise, actually, about encountering other people who are working on this, um, is that the kind of work you're doing is, in the kind of approach you're taking, is very different from my own interests and my own questions. And in part, these arise just because I'm working on Latin America and Africa as opposed to East Asia. But um, I think it also points to why the idea of the symposium is so exciting, that this is a question that brings up a lot of lines of inquiry and interestingly um, exists uh, as a possible node for people doing very, very different kinds of work and asking very, very different kinds of questions, both about literature and different bodies of literature and different traditions of literature, but also about the relationship between politics and literature, politics and aesthetic production, um, politics and aesthetic production in particular historical moment, in particular markets, whether they be national. You talked about the way in which a lot of novels about dictatorship, uh, a lot of works about dictatorship tend to allegorize in a way um, that, you know, it is about getting something out from under a regime of censorship. Um, but a lot of these things are also written in international markets, for international markets, and circulate well beyond the control of the censor, as we imagine, you know, the censor with a black pen xing out a manuscript. And um, I think for me, a lot of the interest of coming to the dictator novel as a specific term comes from my training, you know, both as a Latin Americanist as an Africanist. The term dictator novel doesn't just exist in Latin American literary scholarship, but it's a tradition, and it's a tradition that stretches back to the 19th century. Um, Authors, when they write a novel about a dictator, are thinking about, you know, those who have written about dictators before them. They tend to be self-referential and refer to the tradition. There's also a critical tradition. And for me, the challenge of um, then doing a comparative project was taking the weight of that tradition, the weight of that critical tradition, and seeing, in a sense, whether could travel or translate or move across to Africa, um, working with novels that were similar to the Latin American novels, but I didn't want to just read them under that frame. And I think. What's been so exciting about um, listening to Ginny's work and what's exciting about Symposium is that 
again, I have to put pressure on that framework and see if it actually works or translates. I mean, the framework changes each time, it transforms each time, and that's really how you make something that can be more global or sort of planetary in its reach. That's how you make a framework that's useful to someone that isn't just working in your area. These novels of dictatorship or these dictator novels tend to be a less known work by an author we all know. So I think mm -hmm. Gabriel Garcia Marquez with Autumn of the Patriarch, yes, we all recognize it. Several people have read it, but everyone's read A Hundred Years of Solitude. Mm -hmm. um, Carpentier, people are familiar with him, a little less so now uh, for uh, The Lost Steps, but he also wrote um, a, a very funny dictator novel, a novel that's very much like the Garcia Marquez one in terms of its force, but that is translation is out of print it's got the its title is a very odd translation um, in English reasons of state I think mm -hmm. is the title in English which I, I can't even recall because the translations out of circulation to give some African examples of the same case everyone reads a Chebe's things fall apart in the 80s he writes a dictator novel called Antels of the Savannah again it's kind of a relatively minor work it's a work he sort of writes after his rise to fame. Ngugi Wationgo from Kenya, also very famous, very well known. And then he wrote his last novel, the one that came out um, in the middle of the last decade in 2006, is a huge dictator novel. I think this is also the interesting problem mm -hmm. about teaching novels of dictatorship is that very literally they tend to be uncomfortably to be long. <laughs> it's a 900 page novel in yeah. Ngugi's case. Um, and that's a, that's a really interesting case though because he's really, you know, it's, a, it's sort of uh, the encyclopedia pedia novel of dictatorship. I mean, mm -hmm. he sort of covers, covers everything in that. I, th I think the, the Latin American and the African traditions mm -hmm. have most, uh, probably most most name recognition and yeah. um, uh, for my for my own work there are uh, partly because I think East and Southeast Asia are a little bit lesser known in, in kind of world literature um, circles but certainly there's uh, E. Munyal's uh, novella it's actually a very short novella um, Our Twisted Hero which is about the Pak Chung Hee uh, dictatorship and it's an allegory it's sort of Lord of the Flies kind of allegory so it's set in a school yard but it basically it's a very interesting sort of psychological account of, of how people accede to authoritarianism and why they do it. From Indonesia during the Suharto period, um, the, sort of the most famous Indonesian writer, Pramidi Anantatoa, who, who wrote a series of novels um, that were allegorical, kind of a, you know, about the Indonesian state, um, while he was imprisoned by the by the government. Um, so those novels are interesting. They they. You know, it, it, I guess that's also one of the questions. You know, um, does a novel that's written under these conditions, but not directly address them, you know, is that a, is that a novel of mm -hmm. dictatorship? And how do we how do we categorize that? Um, mm -hmm. Also, I think another another place that's interesting to look at is um, India and South Asia. India, of course, is always touted as the most democratic, you know, one of you know largest democracy in the world, and and in some ways an exception to a lot of the post colonial world because it does have um, you know, democratic elections, um, but not forgetting, of course, Indira Gandhi in the 70s and her em emergency period, which you know was a, um, absolute you know clamping down of mm -hmm. civil rights. Um, and there have been some really interesting works on that. Um, in particular, Rahinton Mysteries: A Fine Balance, another 500-page-ish <laughs> novel, but a wonderful, a wonderful novel and a, a sort of a panoramic account of life under the emergency period. It really varies. So if I is a way of saying something indirectly, broadly stated, one of the easy ways in which um, writers go about talking about a dictatorship is just by not saying where it takes place, right? Or giving the country another name. Um, so Ant Hills of the Savannah, it's not named as Nigeria. We have a city name that it's not Lagos, but you know, we can recognize it um, as something that's relatively real or seems like the world as we know it versus more fantastic representations. Um, so I think, again, Ngugi's Wizard of the Crow goes in this direction, which is we're set in a fictional country in which non-realistic or fantastic things happen. The dictator at one point, because he's frustrated, becomes so inflated, he begins to float and they need to chain him down um, so he won't float away. And of course, at some point, all that air has to be released and it sort of moves the plot along in a very comical, fantastic way clearly we're outside of the realm of the real and that's how it's making its critique which is very different from just not saying certain things that will be evident to us as we're reading. One thing we're hoping to come out of this is perhaps later on a um, an edited collection would be great. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there is an edited, anything like that in existence um, mm -hmm. that will be 
that would be comparative in scope and dealing with these questions of the literary and the political. This is interesting to think about in the way in which you, in the way in which research unfolds, right, and and how in order to work on a project you have to identify a community of people to talk to, and this is this is what. Um, working on this with Ginny and thinking about the symposium and thinking beyond it, one looks for the moments in which you can connect with other people and the project begins to take shape when you have a community of interlocutors. So um, the idea with, you know, besides our individual books and besides the symposium going forward, something like an edited collection or um, a panel at the next ACLA meeting, which will be here at NYU, is being hosted by NYU's Comparative Literature Department. And that's the American... American Comparative Literature Association Conference. So the annual meeting will be here, and that, again, is another occasion in which you're not just bringing together people who are interested in one body of literature, comparative by definition, so you're bringing together people who might not otherwise be familiar with each other's work in order to talk about something um, in which they have a mutual interest. So, again, providing these sort of chances for people to come together. I mean, I think another one of the, the challenges, and really productive challenges that we've had, is thinking together about how to to think through these different typologies of dictatorships. Again, of course, you know, you have Latin America or Africa or Asia having very different um, political and colonial histories. Um, but I think theoretically, one of the things that's interesting about um, looking, using literature to approach this, this problem um, is to look, is to think about the ways that uh, we can connect these different stories and uh, conditions um, but without flattening all the differences mm-hmm. in the same at the same time. Um, so one, you know, so for example, one one might look at the ways in which these novels thematize uh, the the continuities from colonial governance, which of course um, was not uh, in any means uh, a civil, you know, didn't didn't create a civil society. Um, colonial subjects were not treated as uh, citizens or even humans sometimes. Um, so how much that influences the post-colonial dictatorship mm-hmm. um, uh, as opposed to what hap- you know, questions of the Cold War, um, you know, what, what other uh, situations arise, um, the bifurcation of the world, the mm-hmm. sort of um, playing off one side for the other, propping up of dictatorships, of dictators um, by both the US and the Soviet Union. Um, so questions uh, around continuities um, that we see in very very similar across mm-hmm. across different post-colonies, but also paying attention to the differences. So I think that's one of the big challenges, yeah. is how to pay attention to those differences. And, and another question that we were just talking about the other day was, you know, do we look at the Park Jung-hee South Korean dictator in the same way as we would look at Pinochet or Mm -hmm. Mugabe. What difference does it make if if by being a dictator you've actually you actually brought your country into a developed and advanced economy? And in that sense I think you know the bringing into good economy versus uh, exactly what kinds of violence are committed on the way to that right. That the more you know about the conditions of, of violence that made that dictatorship possible the less easy it is to rescue it in the public imagination, but that doesn't mean that functionally, certainly in the way we categorize um, different political regimes, we're not sort of subconsciously doing that. I think also, um, maybe to extend this problem of wanting to see similarity in relation to post-colonial studies, which I think this conversation about dictatorships and the post-colony is very much in continuity with that. Latin America is this... um, it's the great counter example in many ways because it's history of imperial domination, colonization. It comes before and is materially, structurally different from that of much of the rest of what we identify as a post-colonial world. And this is this is a very old conversation in sort of post-colonial studies, Latin American studies, is finding a way to dialogue there. And I think in that sense provides a model that conversation tends to ricochet between saying we can talk to each other or no, we can't, or we can only talk to each other if we agree we're different. And it's a very hard negotiation, and in, in a way, it's it's not one that comes to a conclusion, which is the interesting potential for this project. The, the decisions about how alike things are when you're comparing tend to be provisional rather than final. So we'll see what happens on the yeah. day of the symposium when we have these conversations. Mm-hmm.